Welcome to maybe the smallest, but the second most important room in the house. The first being the bathroom, of course. So we've been working a ton on the mechanical room uh, in our debt-free dream home. And so we wanna start into a video series kind of talking through a lot of the stuff happening in here. Like a lot of mechanical rooms, there are many different phases of things that have sort of come all together over the years and kind of come together in this one room to make all the systems in the house work good. We're not done because there's still other things that need to be added. So this playlist and these videos will grow over time. So today we're going to jump into hot water. Uh, this is something that we started back when we were living in the RV and we really, really wanted to get into the house. We had originally thought we were going to move the RV inside and uh, it became really obvious that the goal was just to get in the stinking house. What are your parents doing over there? They're turd polishing. <laughs> so we, we actually decided, we had like a 30 second heart to heart that we're not wintering in that structure. We refuse to fix the rip in it. It's gonna start raining. So pretty much the push is on to get the RV in there and we'll do what we have to do. Jesse mentioned an outhouse and showering elsewhere. <laughs> and so we kind of made some sort of temporary decisions that helped us kind of bridge from where we were then to where we are now. So let me take you through some of the decisions that we made then and we'll kind of talk about how those things have um, progressed in the mechanical room here. Some of you who've been watching for a long time will remember, uh, we actually had a tankless electric water heater installed here. And it was basically just coming from the cisterns up to the water heater and then fed the single bathroom and the kitchenette area that we had. We did that because it was quick, affordable, and it didn't require any kind of ventilation or anything like that. So it was something that we could basically just bolt to the wall put some electricity to it and we had hot water. At the time, we had a lot of room in the electrical panel because we really didn't have anything else going on. And so that, that particular tankless water heater took up three bays, 240 volt bays in the electrical panel. Again, that tankless water heater was more of a short-term interim solution. We didn't know how short short-term was or how long short-term was, but it was a non-issue at the time. And it worked just fine. Um, it met our needs and it gave us bottomless showers, which were great and allowed us to do laundry and do dishes. And I think the cost for to set everything up was probably 300 and some change, $300 and some change because we had to buy some um, heavy duty cable. I think it was number eight wire, something like that. And then, oh, I forgot the breakers. Actually, the breakers were brutal, forgot about that. Those were probably close to $150 a piece because they're a GFI breaker, which we needed to pass our electrical inspection because we're living in the house and we needed to be able to disconnect those. So those breakers probably were 450 bucks. But the good news is we were actually able to return those and so we got the money back. And so I guess in the end, it was net zero on the breakers. One of the goals in the home design is to minimize internal combustion, minimize air change, make up air, and um, also to minimize the heat load on the house. And so those three things are achieved through a tankless water heater system. Since there's no tank, there's no parasitic heat load in the house. And so even though it was electric, the on-demand water heater did not produce any, um, any parasitic heat. It didn't add anything to the house, which is important because we don't have any air conditioning and we don't want any. We don't wanna to have to like heat up water and then cool down the air and do all this ridiculous energy stuff that a lot of homes do. And so the tankless water heater allowed us to have zero parasitic heat load. Uh, the second thing is there's no combustion and so there's no makeup air. And so we didn't have uh, this kind of drawing of cold air or hot air into the house, uh, making it hard to uh, climatize the house. There were some downsides to the on-demand electric. As I mentioned earlier, the sheer amount of electricity that was required to make this unit work, it was a 36 kilowatt unit. It had three heating elements. 
we did not plan for that when we planned the electrical service to this property. When we had talked to the electrician originally, uh, we said uh, 200 amp service or 400 amp service. And he just assured us that 200 amps was way more than we would ever need ever. And what's interesting is right away, we immediately had a problem because the on-demand water heater was 120 amps, 240 capable, which sucked up a tremendous amount of the capacity of our electric service. So if we were to turn on the clothes dryer, the cooking range, which are both electric, and then the water heater, guess what? We're actually going to exceed our electric service. Um, so we'll talk more about those things uh, in another video, some of the drawbacks of these electric tankless water heaters. But the point is we wanted to stick with the same tenants though, with our ultimate long-term solution, having a tankless system to minimize parasitic heat, no internal combustion. So this unit is our new domestic hot water unit. It's actually a combination boiler, so it serves two functions. We'll talk about the heat function later. The point of today's video is about the domestic hot water side. We will talk more about the natural gas installation and a lot more of the stuff in future videos, but this is the direction we went because we actually have natural gas available. Although at the time when we were originally planning this, we were going the direction of propane. This unit actually has the ability to do both. It can be uh, either fuel source. And that was important to us because while we love the idea of natural gas, there's always that reality that either becomes cost prohibitive or there's some other issue down the road. So this is a combination boiler and it kept true to the no internal combustion concept because it actually draws the combustion air from outside. So this white pipe actually is the intake which goes clear out the outside of the building and the gray pipe is the exhaust. And so while the combustion actually does happen here inside the room, the air that is combusted comes from outside and it is returned to outside. This unit does actually have a small uh, water tank built into it. I think it's around two gallons or three gallons. So it's not a lot, but it does have some parasitic heat load. The cool thing is through the computer system, we're actually able to disable that function. So it's literally just an on-demand tankless water heater, even though there's a small reserve tank. But to kind of minimize the short cycling, like if you're just to wash your hands or you know rinse a dish really quick, to keep the unit from short cycling a bunch, we left that feature turned on. But during the summertime, when we're kind of in that cooling mode and we don't want all this parasitic heat load on the house, which by the way is insidious. It's, it's two or three degrees here, one or two degrees over there, a little here, a little there, and guess what? Now your house is uncomfortable and hot and now you're paying more money to use energy to cool the house down. See if I can show you the label here on the side. So like I said, this is a dual fuel uh, capable boiler. One of the reasons we went with this particular model of boiler is its capacity. And this is important when you look at the total picture. So a lot of you people out there doing HVAC are gonna know that this boiler is way overkill for what we're trying to do on the domestic hot water side. So if you needed just a, a, a tankless uh, natural gas water heater for just hot water, this would be absolutely bonkers. And you'll kind of see as you watch this playlist and get to know the system as a whole that this boiler is a workhorse. So it's 199,000 BTU capable. There's a little uh, fine print in an asterisk in the manual that actually says that from the factory, it's actually only 140,000 BTUs, which works just fine because uh, my imagination based on calculations is that we're probably only using around 40% of the capacity right now, which is not really a good design. Um, but over time, as the house grows and a lot of the other applications grow, the usage will increase. And so it's actually capable of raising the water temperature uh, at about maybe around eight gallons uh, a minute is the rough capacity, depending on the groundwater temperature. I think we're keeping our domestic water at around 115 degrees at the spigot. And our, our groundwater temperature is probably like around 45 degrees or so. So there's times where it's gonna be probably less than seven gallons a minute, maybe closer to five. One of the other big changes in the domestic hot water is essentially that this tank is kept at room temperature. 
since this tank is not outside in some sort of well house or something, and, and it, basically the water heater is having to bring the temperature of that water up, we're starting at around 68 degrees, maybe a little bit warmer because it's in the mechanical room. So really our temperature rise is fairly small when you think about you know the total cycle so unless you took a shower that's you know or took you know used all this water up and it's refilling with groundwater the water heater really isn't working all that hard i'll touch on this in this video just because i know there's people who are going to have questions uh, but i think we'll probably do a video of its own later so why is the exhaust gray and the intake white so the intake here is just schedule 40 pvc it's drain waste and vent d w v and this is obviously vent the problem is the, the building code has shifted so that we are not able to use the Schedule 80 that we were using previously for the exhaust side. The manual does require Schedule 80 within, I think, six inches of the exhaust, and there's some parameters there, but the building code is going this direction. This is a completely new type of pipe. It is called System 636. It's its own pipe, own fittings, own glue, and own primer it is expensive when we did this work this was about a hundred dollars for a 10 foot stick and each fitting was around 50 bucks we had actually built the entire exhaust and it was all approved um, and when this information came to my attention and so we made the executive decision at that time to bring the system up to modern code and so we actually gutted the whole entire exhaust side and rebuilt it using the 636 system to Put into perspective the cost savings on the hot water side alone for this unit is astronomical. Just using the domestic hot water portion of this boiler, we are barely over with a family of people taking numerous showers a day, doing numerous loads of laundry a day, hand washing dishes. We're not being conservative with water we're barely over the minimum bill for the natural gas on this particular unit, which tells you that we're, we're probably under 10 to $12 a month, which is bonkers. To be fair, we have very cheap power where we are, and the electric unit was probably closer to 30 or $40 a month. And again, that was, that was probably being more conservative with water. So for us in our situation with our energy prices where we are, the cost savings is probably between 20 and $30 a month just going from the electric to a natural gas system. So should I share this tank? Let's go ahead and talk about it now. I think we're gonna talk about it more in a future video. So if another video comes out and we touch on this subject um, in more detail, give it some, some thought. And it kind of has to do with what's behind me, but I don't wanna to get too much into the whole mechanical room because this video is gonna to get to be really long. This tanked water heater is actually in line with the domestic hot water side of the combination boiler, and it's electric, obviously. The reason or thinking behind that is twofold. One, in our area, it is very common for people to get extremely excited, especially in the springtime, and start digging things up. And it is very common for the utilities to get dug up, and it creates an outage, at least for several days, uh, if not for longer than that, depending on the severity of the situation, which means we could be without natural gas that quick. And so suddenly, all that wonderful design and engineering is junk because you have no hot water. So we put in a tanked water heater just so we have a redundancy and it's electric. There's actually a third part to this and I'll just touch on it now. We'll talk about it more later when we talk about the heating panel and stuff. But ultimately we wanna have a sidearm heat exchanger on this tank so that in the future when we develop the entire heating system, we'll have a wood boiler outside. That wood boiler will passively heat this tank as a reserve to 180 degrees. And this will actually completely nullify the need for the combination boiler during the heating season when we're actually using the wood boiler to heat the house. So this is a, a triple redundancy. In the winter time, it'll be heated with wood passively to 180 degrees. We'll use a mixing valve, bring it down so that we can heat the shower and everything like around 115 degrees, which will make this tank of water go very, very far. 
when we get start getting wind storms and stuff like that, start talking about power outages and things, um, we actually fire this up by flipping the breaker and just bring it up to heat. It costs about $4 to do. That way if the power goes out, we can use our gravity fed water system and we actually have hot water. We have to be conservative, but we have some. And then if the power were to come back on, then everything would work the way we expect it to normally. And so then this system just overrides the combination boiler because the water is already up to temperature and so the boiler doesn't heat anything. There's going to be uh, a lot more bells and whistles to this system in the future. Uh, one of the things that we want to build into the house is a hot water loop with a circulation pump because of how far it is to the different outlets. Um, we don't want people to have to wait to bring in hot water. And so we've got a system that we're gonna be implementing with a controller that will allow this to basically heat a loop of hot water that circulates very slowly with a very low wattage pump so that when you go to wash your hands anywhere in the house, you know, whatever it is, take a shower, the hot water is there absolutely right now. Let's take a look at the outside of this so you can kind of see the intake and exhaust on the outside right now. All right, and here is intake and exhaust on the outside of the building. Obviously, we've got them just sealed up for the moment. We'll have to do a lot more detail with that when we get to the house wrap. But here's your exhaust side. And eventually, we'll be probably doing a little bit more uh, fitting with this because we're going to potentially have a deck back here in the future. And so we'll need to elbow it out and meet code and get that exhaust away from people in the house. And then the intake side is just a PVC T and it's got a ventilation guard there. Keep bugs and birds and things from getting inside there. All right, so the system is actually on right now and what it's doing is it's just warming that uh, small reserve tank there just to keep it, I think it keeps it like around 120, something like that, maybe 125. I don't think that's the correct temperature, but you can hear how quiet the unit is. almost as quiet as the electric unit. There's a small fan there, and of course, as the unit starts to work harder, it does make a little bit more noise, but we keep the mechanical room closed, and so the noise is no, no negative effect on quality of life in the house. For those who are curious, when we bought this unit was pre-pandemic, and I think we paid probably around $1,400 for it. We're gonna do a lot more content on this subject. It's something that there's a lot of detail around for those who wanna discuss it more in detail. Um, we chose this particular boiler because it was recommended by somebody we trust. I think in the hindsight, um, we'll probably talk more about this later, but we probably wouldn't have bought this unit again. And so we'll just share that more in another video, kind of talking about why we bought it, um, what its features are, and then what we would have bought instead. So that pretty much wraps it up for the combination boiler and the transition from the electric tankless to this beast. It's amazing. Bottomless showers, bottomless dishes, bottomless laundry, just as much water as you have. No, there's never going to be a time where people run out of water. The only thing is I haven't quite figured out when the littles get big enough to take too long of showers, how we're going to do that. I'm not sure if we're going to set a timer or how we're going to keep that under control because the bad side of this is it's literally bottomless. Mm -hmm.